Hey everyone. Hello. I guess uh, four or five minutes in, we can get started. So, Hannah, I'm the public programs manager. Um, and now we'll have Sean, who's the assistant curator of Asian art, um, go forth with his lecture. Well, thanks. Thanks, Johanna. And, and a welcome. Welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, it's really excited to get online with, with, with you all guys <laughs> instead of in a gallery. So um, my talk today uh, is focusing on um, the ceramics and porcelains from the Liao Dynasty. As many of you know, San Antonio Museum of Art is really known for having a stellar collection of Chinese ceramics. Um, pretty much spanning from the prehistory time all the way through the uh, very end of the uh, Qing Dynasty, the last imperial dynasty. Um, some of you may recall, once you walk into the Chinese gallery, uh, you may see this gallery space. We uh, dedicated this whole gallery space for presenting ceramics from the Liao Dynasty, which was founded um, uh, in uh, 906 and ended in 1125. Um, I was in this gallery quite often and I saw people walking this gallery, uh, walking around very quickly and leave very quickly as well. So many of the pieces in this gallery are quite unlike from those early Chinese ceramics um, before you walk in this gallery. Uh, those early Chinese ceramics you may recall, includes very tall, very dramatic and colorful tomb guardians. And this group of Liao ceramics, also very unlike those blue and white porcelains, which is behind this gallery, which is very refined, very elegant and pretty. And this group of Liao ceramics, mostly um, monochrome, which is single color, green, yellow, as you see here, this uh, yellow uh, jar, or white, um, green, yellow, black, sometimes black. So it's not visually uh, exciting to a lot of people. But actually, um, uh, they played a very impor important role uh, in Chinese ceramic history. And the people who made those pieces are called Kitans. Um, let's go to the second, next one. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, Liao Dynasty was founded in uh, 906, pretty much spanning from the eastern part of China all the way to uh, Central Asia. And on their east is Korea. Um, uh, during that time, uh, it's called the Goryeo Dynasty. And on their south, it's the Chinese Dynasty. It's called the Song Dynasty. So this is the Chinese Dynasty. And this is the Kitan. Um, people founded the Liao Dynasty. On their uh, west, the Uyghurs, um, um, today the Uyghurs are mostly Muslims, and also the Xixia Dynasty, the Tongus, and of course on this part of China uh, is Tibet. Um, further south, the Dali Kingdom, uh, which has now become part of the China, it's called the Yunnan province, but during that part of time, uh, it's called the Dali Kingdom. And further south, the Khmer uh, Empire. So today, when a lot of people are talking about China in Chinese, it sounds like uh, monolithic. But actually, in China, China's history, uh, there are lots of non-Chinese uh, uh, people uh, uh, established their own empires and dynasties that coexist with the Chinese dynasties. Sometimes they had quite a peaceful relationship. Sometimes they had a very competitive and even a hostile relationship. So. The Liao and the Song Dynasty, um, sometimes they're allies, they trade, they send, um, um, they trade silk, um, um, porcelains, and but most of the time, the relationship is pretty hostile. Uh, let's go to this one. So the Liao Dynasty, as this map shows, uh, let me just minimize this, includes five capitals, which is very different from the Chinese dynasty. They usually have one, like the Song dynasty capital is here, Kaifeng. But the Liao, uh, the Kitans founded the five um, uh, capitals with the, um, the major capital or the supreme capital is in, the, is in the north. It's called the Linghuang. And the eastern capital, central capital, southern capital, and western capital. Why? Why the Kitans use 
five capitals because they, their lifestyle is nomadic. They are nomads. Um, depends on the seasons. They change, uh, uh, um, uh, they move their uh, um, capitals among these five cities. Uh, springtime is usually on the east, east and the summer is in, in the north, and the winter they usually spend their time uh, in the south and the west. They roam around among these um, um, five capitals. That's good. This is a Google map I just want to show you. The Liao Kingdom includes this large stretch of land mass, which is mostly deserts. It's, it's, this is the Mongolian plateau. It's, it's it, the Gobi Desert is here. Their eastern part is a little bit uh, um, points. Um, so this part of the China is, during the winter time is very cold. Summer is very brief. So the nomad, the, the Kitan people pretty much roam around depending on the season. They, their lifestyle is hurting. They're unlike the Chinese, which is mostly practice agriculture in the south because the climate is a lot warmer. So uh, many times they, uh, the Kitans uh, raid uh, the Song Dynasty and they sacked cities and, and, and looted um, 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 rich cities and also brought people, especially artisans, back to the north, to the empires. So the Song Dynasty really had a hard time to deal with the Kitans, with the Liaos, Liao Dynasty. In 1004, uh, Song and the Liao signed a peace treaty. So basically, the Chinese agreed to pay the Kitans 100,000 rolls of silk each year, and also 100,000 um, 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 tallies, it's called tallies of silver. So it's pretty much the Chinese bought peace from the Kitans. And actually, the Kitans honored this peace treaty and never invaded the China, uh, the Song Dynasty in the South, pretty much for 200 years. So the two dynasties coexist afterwards, after 1004, uh, peacefully, and they established very strong cultural, economic, and religious ties between the two major powers um, um, in China during the uh, uh, 10th century, 10th, 11th century. And the Kitans, as I mentioned earlier, they're not Chinese. They um, um, uh, didn't speak Chinese, they have their own language, and their hairstyle is very different from the Chinese. They, they shave their head, forehead and the back, back head as well, and only keep this two strand of the head on the two sides. And they also wear dress this round neck long robes, which has slit on um, the sides, which is easier for them to ride in horses. And this is just a modern uh, uh, picture of, uh, of the Liao, uh, the Kitan uh, people's hairstyle. And uh, this is a painting by a Kitan artist uh, of the 10th century. Currently, this painting is in the Palace Museum of Taipei. It shows the nomadic lifestyle of the Kitans. Um, they're very good at riding horses, and they are um, um, practice hunting, and also um, fishing as well. So it's totally different lifestyle uh, compared with the Chinese who lives in the South, mostly peasants and farmers taking care of their lands. Um, so these two different, your different lifestyles create, sometimes create tensions between uh, the, two, the, the two cultures. Um, feel free to ask me if you have any questions. And this is the one, this is the uh, golden crown of the Liao Dynasty. Actually in our collection, uh, if you uh, uh, go to the Liao Dynasty gallery, you will see this crown. It's a very, very uh, impressive and a beautiful uh, gold crown. It's made of uh, um, bronze and then gilded. And the two phoenix uh, with, a, with a flaming pearl uh, in the center. Um, this crown could be owned by uh, a noble uh, man or woman uh, wearing this crown for an, uh, important religious occasions. And also silk. Um, they, uh, the Kitans traded silk uh, with the Chinese on the south. And this is a, um, uh, a, a Liao Dynasty uh, robe found, actually found from the tomb, from the Liao Dynasty tomb. And when this piece, this, this piece is currently in a private collection in Europe, but when this piece was founded in fragments and the conservator just 
reconstruct this whole piece uh, and form this amazing uh, Liao Dynasty uh, robe. It actually include, uh, includes several roundels of phoenix, the two phoenix um, uh, flying um, um, after each other with a flaming pearl. And the phoenix is made of gold wires and the silver wires. And the silver becomes a little bit tarnished, but the gold part is still in a very pristine condition. So I just want to show you uh, the rich material culture that the Kitan people build up. Actually, the Kitans were first recorded in Chinese history in the, in the sixth century. And at that time, they were just um, uh, minor tribes, tribes um, uh, living in the north, living in the Mongolian plateau in Siberia with the Chinese, major Chinese dynasty, Tang dynasty in the south. When the Tang collapsed in the uh, early eighth century, um, the Kitans quickly rise up and they build up their power. They consolidated their different tribes. And when China was, and when, when Tang Dynasty collapsed and before the Song Dynasty built it, and China was in turmoil. And the Kitans were very smart to seize the opportunity to build up their um, uh, um, empire. It's called the Liao Dynasty. Liao Dynasty is the first non Chinese dynasty that was built in Chinese history that coexists with a major Chinese dynasty in the South. And before Liao, um, they only have some minor tribes, sometimes give headaches to the Chinese uh, empires, but never seriously challenged the Chinese in the South. But Liao uh, was the first one. And also Beijing, Beijing became the capital. Um, Beijing was called Nanjing. One of the, uh, Beijing is the southern capital of the Liao dynasty. And that is the first time Beijing became capital uh, in China. And after the Liao Beijing, again, became the capitals of other dynasties. But the Liao, the Kitans first used Beijing as one of their five capitals. And this is amazing Guanyin from the Liao dynasty, currently in the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City. It's one of the treasures of Nelson Atkins. It shows the extreme craftsmanship that the Liao people can do um, um, to build this beautiful sculpture and also, uh, Kitans follow Buddhism. Before they built their dynasty, their empire, they all, uh, the Kitans pretty much um, were um, practiced shamanism. But as the Kitans interact with the Chinese themselves, they gradually adopt Buddhism and became devout um, Buddhist followers um, um, during their 200 years history. And this is one of the amazing um, 10th century Wen Yin uh, um, found in the Liao territory and left China in the early 20th century and ended up in the Nelson Atkins in Kansas City. Uh, Sean. Yes. I, what is it? Is um, the Buddha sitting on? Is it just a pedestal? This Buddha is sitting on a, a, a rock um, by a river. Um, and the pose of this Buddha is called a royal ease, actually started from the Buddhist, Buddhist art from India. But first introduced uh, to China by the Chinese, by the pilgrims traveled on a Silk Road to reach in China, and the Kitans adopted this um, uh, pose, which is called a royal ease pose, and incorporate this uh, um, pose in their own uh, Buddhist sculpture. So, uh, uh, the gender is male. Um, uh, where, during the 10th century, the Guan Yin or the, uh, the Bodhisattva compassion was still a man, but later time it became a woman. By this time, it's just still a man. So it sits on a rock by, uh, the, the, uh, sur uh, surrounded by water wave waves, which symbolize the Southern China Sea, because Guan Yin is believed uh, to live uh, in an island in the su South China Sea. So uh, this is the um, showing when you sit on a uh, rock uh, with waters around and step on the lotus flower. Mm. And um, from the chat, someone's wondering, you know what it's made out of? Oh, it's made of wood. Uh, oh, it's, wow. made of, uh, it's made of wood and covered with the pigments, with lacquer, and then gilding. Some gildings do uh, uh, exist, but mostly mineral pigments. Um, the red probably is the cinnabar, the green is probably grounded in malachite and the lapis, all those um, uh, minerals, and mixed with lacquer and covered uh, uh, on the wood. So it's covered from wood. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Feel free to ask me if you have any questions.
So now let's talk about uh, the Liao ceramics. Um, most of the kilns of the Liao dynasty are pretty much all surrounded um, um, around their capitals. So this is the supreme capital in the north. This is the Nanjing, which is actually Beijing. Uh, it's called Nanjing, means, Nanjing means the southern capital, but uh, it's actually today's Beijing, which means north capital. It's quite confusing, but this is Beijing, uh, today's Beijing. So all the Liao Dynasty kilns are built around their five capitals. And before uh, the Khitans established their own empire, um, uh, they didn't use ceramics. Um, um, they didn't have their own written script. They um, um, didn't have uh, the skills and uh, the know-how to, uh, to fire ceramics. Uh, in the early parts of their history, when we, before they signing the peace treaty with the Chinese in the south, like I mentioned earlier, they constantly raid the kilns and the other cities uh, in the Song Dynasty and took the artisans back to the north and asked these Chinese artisans to work for them. So throughout history, uh, the Liao Dynasty history, the relationship between the Kitans and the Chinese live in the Liao territory are quite nice, actually. Um, many murals, the two murals shows the Kitans and the Chinese having parties together and taking care of their horses together. So it's really amazing the relationship between uh, the Kitans and the Chinese live in the Liao dynasty. But in terms of the relationship between the Liao and the Song, in the early part it was pretty hostile. But later, uh, the, uh, the Chinese pay, just pay the Kitans for their peace. Um, it's actually a pretty good deal. Those silks and the silver that the Chinese pay to the Liao is really nothing compared with their annual revenues because the Song Dynasty in the South is really a rich dynasty. They trade along the China Sea with the Persians, with the Europeans. So they had a lot of money. They, they're really smart, pay a small amount of cost for the, for, the, uh, for the peace, just tell the Kitans, you stay in the north, don't bother us, we pay the money to you. So that's pretty much the, uh, the peace treaty of, of um, 1004. So this is the two pictures showing the kiln sites today. Uh, again, uh, today it's uh, kilns mostly in Inner Mongolia. Inner Mongolia uh, is a province um, in the north part of, uh, of China. So as you can see, it's pretty much deserted. And um, for the kiln sites, almost all the kilns in China are by the river. We can see from here at the river for a couple of reasons. First, uh, for transportation. When, 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 when the ceramics and potteries are fired, they need to ship them out. And the river is the easiest way. Another reason is that uh, river provides the source of water, so the potters can use the waters to wash the, uh, uh, the earth, the ceramic earth, the porcelain earth, and uh, make uh, um, pre-fired pieces. So buying the river is really important. Um, uh, it's one of the poorest regions in China today. Um, we, can, we can pretty much can tell it's, it's very few people living here. And this just shows the Liao Dynasty ceramic pieces, broken pieces stacked in uh, the soils even today in different layers um, from different periods. Uh, you can see all those fragments still um, can easily be found uh, in the king sites, in the ancient king site, which is over a thousand years old. And this is the one of the kilns um, in the supreme capital in the north. It's a, ho a horse shoes shaped kiln. And, um, and the pieces are pretty much stacked here. And this is the chimney going up uh, for uh, firing the pieces. Uh, the potters used wood instead of uh, coals, although uh, uh, that part of China today produced a lot of coal. But at that time, uh, the potters, potters just used wood uh, as a source of the energy uh, for firing um, ceramics. And those are the pieces found in those kiln sites and you can see this is the uh, white porcelains, green, multicolor, we call it uh, tricolor or sun tie glaze, blue, amber. So our museum collection is all the pieces 
representing these kind of colors. I will show you later. This shape, this triangular shaped uh, piece is actually spacers. They put between the piece between the pot, between the pots, vessels, bowls, because those pieces are stacked in kilns uh, during the firing. So this, this are spacers. Uh, because once you can stack, stack bowls and vessels together, it will save space. It will be a lot more uh, economical, save the energy, save time, and also cost, of course. And this is one of the earliest um, piece came of Liao Dynasty piece came to the museum uh, uh, in 1998. It's actually um, uh, one of the star piece in, uh, in our entire Chinese ceramic collection. And it's called Buddhist Urn. It's actually for containing ashes um, um, because uh, most of the people um, uh, during the Liao Dynasty, especially those uh, uh, ruling uh, class, uh, follow Buddhism. Uh, so after they died, they cremated, and their ashes stored in this uh, little chamber. And the whole piece, this part, the middle section, is made like a pagoda. So this is represent the roof edge, and roof ridge, and ended with the dragon heads. And then this is the middle, the main chamber for containing ashes, and sit on a lotus flower. And the lotus flower growing out from the pond, which is encircled by this, um, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, like handrail rails or baluster. And the whole piece is surmounted by another little flower and then a pearl at a very, on the very top. Firing this piece, making potting, I mean, making this piece is really technically challenging and especially firing because during the firing process, the temperature, um, and the rising and the cooling process, the amount of oxygen need to be very carefully uh, calculated. Otherwise, it will not come out like this. Um, the color will not turn out like green. If the temperature is too high, uh, it may uh, warp or out of shape. If it's below the temp certain temperature, um, um, it will not fire. The green will not turn out this like jade, um, um, uh, deep blue, deep green color. So it's it's very challenging to fire this piece. And on the right, this is a Tibetan tanka painting in our. Uh, collection is also one of our quite important piece. It will be loaned to the Rural Museum uh, in New York next year for an exhibition. So this Tonka painting portrayed the Amida Buddha, the Buddha of the Western paradise, sitting under the canopy. And the Buddha is attended by the deities and also the monks in the front. But actually, the focal point of this piece is this pond, is this lotus pond in front of this Buddha. So the lotus flower growing out of this front of the pond and the souls of the deceased were reborn on this lotus flowers in the Western paradise. So one of the uh, teachings in Buddhism is that people need to do good things to build up good karma. So when we died, their next life will be reborn in paradise, in Western paradise. So this tanka pretty much showing uh, the scene of the Western paradise. The reason I want to put this one next to this one is the Liao, the Kitan potters actually using this ceramic piece to create this pond in front of the Amida Buddha, this lotus flower flower growing out from the pond with the person holding this person to ashes and in a um, pagoda shaped vessel. So it's really uh, amazing to show the Kitans adopt this important iconography in Buddhism art and use that in their ceramic art, in a ceramic piece. And, and this, is the, this is the 19th, this is the uh, 17th century 18th century piece, this is the 10th century. And this iconography goes on after Liao Dynasty collapsed. And this piece, this is another important piece showing the Western paradise, but actually uh, this, uh, this piece is a lot earlier 
um, sixth century. Also uh, in the Smithsonian uh, free sacral collection showing the Buddha sitting under the canopy with a lotus pond in front of him with this souls, the image of the souls uh, of the deceased people reborn on this lotus flowers. So this piece showing that this iconography actually started very early and the Kitan people adopt this and use in their uh, ceramic art. And this is a piece is, um, um, is so rare that I didn't see any other similar pieces in China. Um, uh, Yale University Gallery has a similar piece, but that's the only piece I found which is quite similar to this one. I didn't see any other pieces uh, like this one uh, in China. So San Antonio Museum is really fortunate to have uh, this uh, Buddhist vessel uh, in our collection. Another thing I would like to highlight that is the Kitans use lead uh, in their glaze. So uh, lead can lower uh, the firing temperature. So a piece like this actually fired twice. The first time um, after it was potted and covered with a slip. The slip is this white refined um, uh, 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 material uh, that can hide some coarse particles um, in the ceramic earth, so making glaze looking better. So it was potted and covered with a slip and fired around 1,200 degree and took it out and cooled down and covered with a screen glaze mixed with lead and fired a second time. The lead will lower the firing temperature so that glaze can flow, cover the pieces without the temperature going too high, otherwise the, um, uh, uh, the pre-fired piece will, will, will be deformed. So the Kitans learn, really learned this amazing technique from uh, the Chinese potters in the South by adding lead uh, into the glaze to lower the firing temperature. And also lowering the firing temperature saves energy, uh, save time as well. It's, it's quite economical uh, uh, too. So this is another uh, amazing uh, large size vessel in our collection. It's from the Liao Dynasty. Again, this piece um, has this thick round uh, lips and beautiful um, uh, um, profiles. And cover, again, uh, um, um, the ceramic earth is co covered with white glaze. And then the potters use pointed bamboo stick to carve out this beautiful peony flower. And then use this tiny, uh, um, create this, tiny, we call it uh, the comb shaped uh, uh, pattern because using tiny combs to create this kind of a series of parallel lines to highlight to uh, highlight the texture the peony flower petals and then they painted this space with iron based pigments and then covered with a transparent clear glaze um, to create this amazing large vessel again creating this piece and firing this piece is not an easy job even today um, before, um, you can imagine during the 10th century, people just based on their uh, knowledge and experience, there was no any other tools like thermometer to tell them the temperature, totally based on their um, years of practice and uh, experience to decide when the firing is good enough, uh, uh, when it's need more time. Um, this kind of like black background, white, uh, um, um, floor pattern is very popular uh, technique. Another way, another style or, or method of creating this black background is sometimes the potters just carved away this white slip and revealing the dark uh, body of the piece. And then they just covered it with, with a clear glaze and fire it. And this one, I guess the potter just want to save some time. So the potter you just use uh, iron pigments to paint it, this, the background, to create this kind of like darker um, background to highlight the peony flowers. Again, uh, um, peony flower uh, uh, is very popular in Chinese art, in Korean and Japanese art as well, to symbolize wealth and also the status. So um, peony flower, 
uh, appears in Chinese ceramics repetitively, pretty much from early time all the way through the very end uh, of imperial China. And um, when this kind of technique using darker background to highlight this white peony flower or other flower started, we don't know. But the tradition of this, this technique carries on after the Liao Dynasty long gone. And this is the, uh, another jar we accepted a couple of years ago to the museum collection. Actually, it's a Korean jar. Um, it's late 19th century, early 20th century Korean jar, also very large size. The Korean potters use the same technique, uh, a very coarse body covered with a white a slip and a carved way to form this fish, a fish, a carp, a swimming in a lotus palm. This is the lotus flower. Basically, the white slip just carved away to reveal this darker uh, body uh, of the piece, and then cover it with a clear glaze and fire it. So this kind of like decorating, decorative uh, technique goes on for centuries, even to the early 20th century, um, after Liao Dynasty uh, collapsed. Okay, this is another piece I would like to talk about uh, in our collection. It's a vessel sitting in a bowl. Uh, uh, the, vest, the bowl is decorated, is carved uh, with this uh, upward pointed banana tree leaves. Um, uh, the Kitans in the north, we don't have banana trees, but the Kitans love to use exotic plants and animals to decorate, to decorate uh, their pieces. Um, 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 sometimes you can see uh, parakeets, monkeys, I'll show you later, and also other plants from the south. Um, this is a wine vessel. Um, in early times, uh, uh, the Kitans uh, like warm, warmer wine. They don't like to drink uh, cold wine. So they put this wine in hot water um, in the bowl to keep it warm. And, uh, and they also covered with white uh, slip and then clear glaze and fire it. And this is the overlapping of flower petals and the banana tree leaves. And also this is dragon head holding this sprout um, um, for pouring uh, uh, warm wines. And this is a tomb mural of Liao Dynasty. It shows this Kitan person pouring wines into this cup holding by a Chinese. How can you tell? Because of the hairstyle. This is the Kitan hairstyle, and this is the Chinese. They always keep their ha hair because the Chinese never shave their hair because uh, it's um, the, by the Confucius value. Uh, hair is part of your body that are given to you by your parents. We're not supposed to, to shave your hair. So they uh, uh, comb up their hair to form a, a bun on top of hair, and then wearing this kind of uh, box-shaped hat. So this is the Chinese, this is the Kitan. You're preparing a banquet or party, so pouring wines to this cup. This is the one vessel. See that? And this, this mural also shows the good relationship between the Kitans and the Chinese living the, uh, in the Liao territory. So is the vessel, is it one piece or? It's, it's two piece. It's okay. two separate pieces. Yeah, you can take this bottle out from this, from this bowl. It's two separate pieces. Another tomb mural from Liao Dynasty shows this type of vessel is quite popular. Um, uh, it's quite commonly used uh, during that time. So for preparing banquets, holding uh, uh, wines in warm water. Again, the two Chinese can tell from their uh, from their dress, from their, from their hat. And uh, one of the most iconic ceramic, ceramic pieces from Liao Dynasty is this flask. It's called uh, either uh, called pilgrim flask or more commonly cockcoom flask because this part, this part of the vessel represents a cockcoom. So uh, uh, it was first actually after Liao Dynasty collapsed in 1125, this type of vessels pretty much disappeared, disappeared uh, in, in China. Um, and people rediscovered this type of vessel in early uh, 20th century in the Northern China, 
in Manchuria, in Mongolia. Actually, first by some French missionaries. And people named this uh, type of vessel, it's called Kalkum vessels, Kalkum flask. Um, they, they actually, this type of vessel is modeled after leather jars. The Kitans are nomadic people. They need to have vessel, uh, water jars. So they use deer skin to create this uh, type of jars for holding waters when, we, uh, uh, when the Kitans riding horses. So after uh, uh, the Kitans start to uh, uh, interact with the Chinese and learn how to create uh, porcelains and earthenwares, they start creating this type of uh, flask. Uh, only found in Liao Dynasty, only in Northern China. Um, um, never before, never after, not in other parts of China. So the museum has quite a few of this type of white vessels, different styles. This is probably earlier. This is probably earlier, and it's probably later. Why? Because this piece has this ring foot uh, underneath. When the Liao people start, Kitan start to uh, learn from the Chinese, they gradually adopt the Chinese uh, more sedentary lifestyle. Uh, they settle down, um, start to do fishing, a little bit uh, agriculture as well during the later part of the dynasty. So they made this vessel more stable, they sit it on a table on the ground. They start adding this ring foot uh, underneath. And this is the two monkeys sit on top of the, uh, this vessel. Why? We don't know. A lot of scholars have different uh, uh, speculations for why um, the Kitans use the two monkeys sit on the top, but nobody gave very convincing answers for that. And plus, uh, the monkeys, I mean, it's too north, too cold for the monkeys to live in the north. Um, again, uh, lotus flower um, on top of the two uh, cloud scrolls. Um, um, a lotus flower represents purity, it represents rebirth. Again, it's associated with the Buddhism. Um, that should, uh, that, uh, this piece indicates um, uh, the influence of a Buddhism, Buddhism and Buddhism art start to appear uh, um, in the uh, Liao Dynasty uh, ceramics. Next one. Oh, okay. Our museum has two wooden flasks, which is extremely rare. Um, I uh, did quite a few research, reading through archaeological reports since 1950s all the way to today. Um, it's very rare to find wooden uh, flask uh, from the tombs. Mostly this pair uh, is from the, tomb, uh, from the tombs. So it's very hard to preserve wooden flasks and they pretty much follow the same shape. And this is the, the side view. You can see this, is, this, this one is taken from this, from this angle. And it has this beautiful gilded lid on the top. This is the one. Um, uh, it's made of uh, copper and then gilded. Uh, it's in very good condition. The two holes are uh, covered with this um, um, Blossoming flowers and also gilded flowers. It's, uh, it's very rare to have wooden flags um, um, in, in the museum's collection because they are so hard to find. What the flask, okay. I'm sorry, um, would yeah. the flask have some kind of lid like that as well with a, a chain on the. You mean for this one? For the or other for, two that we saw. The, uh, sometimes the porcelain says lid on it. Uh, okay. Actually, we had a credit few. I didn't use them here. Uh, but most of the time, you like this. No, this one is mostly have a lid, but it's just missing. Um, uh, for this piece, I don't think so. Even if it has lid, it's mostly made of wood, just um, stuck in it um, um, to seal this. But this one should have an original ceramic lid to, to cover this opening. Um, this, and then a question from the chat is wondering what kind of wood is this and are they too fragile to display or are they on display? Uh, they're not. I found this one in, uh, in the storage. That's why I use my cell phone to take those pictures on the card. <laughs> on the card, so you probably can tell it's not in the uh, museum case. 
Um, I'm not quite sure why it's not on view, but I definitely would lo love to put this one on view. Uh, their condition is okay. This one, this pair uh, of wooden flats probably uh, have pigments on it, um, but it's just gone after a thousand years. The pigments are all gone. But in terms of wood, it's, it could be pine wood. It's very light. It's not that heavy holding hands. Um, no cracks. Um, um, uh, uh, the cavity just hollowed out to form um, um, the cavity for containing uh, waters or, or wines. Uh, in good condition. Yeah, I would love to put this one on, on view next to the ceramic ones to show. Uh, the different materials, the leather, wood, ceramics that Kitan people use to create this kind of flask. Um, I want to uh, include this one. This is a beautiful green glaze jar uh, from, from our collection. Uh, the profile is amazing, smooth um, um, shape, and also um, um, overlapping uh, water uh, flower petals around the shoulder. Uh, flower, overlapping flower petals around the foot. In the middle is this uh, beautiful peony flower. So uh, again, and also uh, potted, covered with white glaze, a white slip, and then carved away. This piece, the background is carved away. Uh, you can probably can tell from this uh, picture. And then covered with a sort of a transparent green glaze. Um, some parts of the glaze peeling off um, because the, uh, the mica, the con content of mica in this glaze is quite high. So after a thousand years, they start to crack and peeling off. But I don't think it's kind of like defects. Honestly, I think those kind of like, um, this kind of um, peeling off add a kind of like charm to this piece, make this piece really uh, um, charming uh, to me. So uh, yeah, so it's carved away in the green glaze and beautifully potted. This is another one. And also, uh, this one probably can tell better. This is all the original uh, um, uh, body reviewed by carving away this white slip and then covered with the uh, transparent glaze and a little bit of green glaze to highlight the leaves. And I want to show you the bottom part of this piece, you can tell how coarse uh, the clay is. And this part is the white slip. And then uh, uh, a, a, a layer of transparent glaze. Um, one of the key features or characters of Liao ceramics is they're pretty coarse and rustic. They're not that refined compared with the Chinese ceramics from the South at the same time. Um, a couple of reasons. I think one of the reasons that um, um, in the Northern China, the ceramic earth is just not that high quality as those Gaoling uh, ceramic earth found from the South, which is like you can fire uh, uh, to almost like uh, two porcelains, but this is just um, uh, stoneware because it's so coarse. Another reason, I think uh, is that uh, if you consider Northern China, it's cold, extremely cold, and the Kitans are nomadic, their, their, their aesthetic taste probably more tailored to this kind of rustic, coarse style compared with this highly, highly refined uh, Chinese piece from the South. But I don't think this kind of like rustic or coarse um, 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 type of ceramics is kind of make this type of ceramics inferior compared to the Chinese piece from the South. I think they have their own place uh, in the history of Chinese ceramics. Um, we have a question from the yeah. um, They're asking, how do they apply the green, which looks like it's over the slip and carved out pattern? Uh, so basically, uh, uh, the slip carved out and then covered the layer of transparent uh, clear glaze and then use brush to add a little bit of green glaze over the transparent uh, uh, glaze to create this kind of like light green pattern. So two layers of glaze. Use brush. 
And this is another amazing piece in our collection. Again, it's not on view. This piece is not on view. This is not on view. You can tell. This is the cart I pulled out from the, uh, the storage. So we have lots of uh, uh, Liao uh, ceramics in our collection. Uh, it's uh, actually given to the museum by the late museum trustee, uh, Mr. Mr. Water Brown. In 2013, uh, it gave the museum probably around 300 pieces. So, San Antonio Museum probably has the largest Liao dynasty ceramics in the United States, um, representing pretty much major kilns and major styles and different te decorative techniques. Um, this is another amazing piece uh, in our uh, collection. This is called a phoenix vessel because of this part of a phoenix hat on top of this long tube neck and then surmounted with this um, um, flower-shaped bow on the top. And the, the body is made of this beautiful uh, potted round-shaped uh, vessel and then uh, carved out this extremely beautiful lotus flower. Um, the potters just use um, um, pointed to either wooden stake or bamboo stake. Just create this one. And it's, it's, it's all, I'm pretty much almost certain this potter is not educated. It's probably, it's very likely he's illiterate because potters in Chinese, in, in imperial China is considered low, very low rank in the social status. They, 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 they're not educated, they, they couldn't read, but this artist definitely, this potter is definitely a very well accomplished artist. He just created, used a very few simple lines, fluent and simple lines to create this amazing uh, lotus flowers. Um, he had, probably he can visualize in his mind and based on his experience, he just created this one, this, this lotus flower with this uh, stems flowing around the lotus flowers and the next covered another uh, set of uh, banana leaves and flower patterns. And a lot of ceramics, Liao dynasty ceramics, are actually modeled after uh, metal vessels, especially those precious metal vessels, gold and silver. And this is one of them. This is one of the vessels probably inspired the potter to make this one. It's a phoenix head of vessels, has a handle, of course the handle is gone, holding this flower-shaped uh, uh, cup on the top and this bobulous or rounded body, body um, in the lower part. Um, but the later part of the Liao dynasty, the empress passed some laws banning people using uh, precious metal vessels for their tombs. Um, because uh, the emperor uh, considered that's kind of wasteful and also not good for the dynasty. So people started using ceramics and pot potteries to copy earlier uh, metal vessels, either for their daily use or include them in their tombs. Um, this is just amazing to show uh, where this one uh, comes from. This is the Tang Dynasty earlier piece, uh, probably 7th, 8th century piece. And another major school uh, in the Liao ceramics is called, is called tricolor ceramics uh, or, or earthenware. It's tricolor because it largely include three colors like white, green, and amber, this kind of yellowish amber color. And uh, I'll say half of our Liao uh, ceramic collection is pretty much this tricolor uh, glaze uh, ceramics. And this, is a, uh, this, this one is made by using molds, um, two section molds, and putting together to form this strangely looking vessel. It's, it's a, a, a human head uh, on top of the a body of the birds. And then this is the uh, uh, spout for pouring out uh, water or wines. And this is the uh, flower shaped mouth on the top. Um, when we talk about tricolor 
uh, ceramic glaze. Um, you probably recall uh, this piece in our early Chinese ceramic glass uh, uh, gallery. It's also called tricolor uh, glaze uh, piece. Uh, again, it's from a little bit earlier, Tang Dynasty. Um, the Kitans, um, there's no solid evidence that the Kitans adopt the earlier um, tricolor technique. Because when the Tang Dynasty collapsed, and before the Kitans start making this piece, there are 200 years in between, uh, between this, this, this one and this one. So it's very likely that Kitans probably figured out how to use tricolor on themselves. And um, during the Tang Dynasty, pieces like this, it's all made for the tombs, for the burial purposes. It's not made for the living. So people may purchase this one for their tombs because they are believed to continuously either guard the tombs or provide comfort or wealth for the people in the afterlife. Um, well, for the Kitans, for the Liao people, they use tricolor glaze for their daily utensils. This piece is for you for use daily use. There is not for um, burial for the tombs. Of course, people can still include in the tombs, but this one uh, is made for for the market for people use daily. But this one uh, is made for the tombs for the burial. So this is the major difference between these two major style of tricolor glaze potteries. Uh, another technical difference is that um, during the early time during the Tang Dynasty. The, the glaze are free flowing over the piece. Like uh, the potters just use a uh, brush and sometimes we directly pouring the glaze over the piece and letting the, the glaze free flow. Well, during the Liao times, the potters use brush carefully painted over the piece, depending on different sections. So uh, for the wings, so like this, uh, white and green for the body is largely yellow. So you, you, there's no free flow of glaze on this piece. So that's another uh, difference between the tricolor glaze from the Liao, which is later, and also the tricolor piece from the Tang, which is a little bit earlier. We have a question from the chat, yeah. um, actually from one of the artists we spoke to earlier this month, Hiromi Stringer. Um, she's wondering if the foundation of the for the camel and rider, is it attached to Yes, it, it, it's part of the whole piece. Okay. It's part of the whole piece, I guess, for, uh, for uh, stabilizing uh, the, this piece, the camel, when this piece was put in the tomb. Um, another, another key difference I forgot to mention is that um, the tricolor piece on the tongue, uh, the potters didn't use uh, slip, uh, um, 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 slip because uh, the ceramic earth is good enough, it's highly fine, uh, ceramic earth. It's white, it's highly refined, so there's no need to use slip to cover this piece up. They just pour glaze directly over the pre-fire piece. But for the Liao piece, this is white, the white face, and that's the wing, this part, all uh, the color from white slip. So because, again, because the, the earth, the ceramic earth is quite coarse from, from northern China. And in terms of the identity of this piece, it's actually it's called Kalavinka. It's from the Buddhist art because uh, Kalavinka started from India and as a songbird. So uh, it's uh, when uh, 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 the Buddha reached uh, um, uh, a meditation or other like start preaching, Kalavinka usually uh, hovering above the Buddha and making beautiful sound sounds. And, and, and when the Buddhism reached the China and the Chinese artists start to make a lot of images like this, human head, bird body, Kalavinka. Uh, this one is a vessel. This is another uh, Kalavinka in other museums, um, human head, and also uh, with the two wings um, for uh, making um, beautiful songs uh, in Buddhist rituals. Believe it or not, we have a watermelon. Uh, in, in our uh, collection. And the Kitan people is the first people to introduce watermelon from Central Asia to China. And uh, when they uh, 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 
um, uh, reaching Central Asia. If you, if you can recall, the territory, uh, the map of the Liao Dynasty is all spread, it stretches all westward to Central Asia. And uh, when they tried to conquer Central Asia, they uh, um, had watermelons and they brought seeds to, to their own um, um, empire and started planting watermelons in northern China. And it, it did grow there. It's cold there, but the watermelons uh, did grow there. And the Chinese from the south uh, start to get to uh, get to know uh, watermelon. Start to planting watermelons in their uh, in the southern China, uh, uh, from the Kitans. And this this is a mural showing this Chinese uh, nobleman enjoying wines and the fruit. And this is a watermelon. This is a tomb mural. Again, this is a 10th century tomb mural. And we can see the watermelon here. Of course, it's a lot smaller. It's a lot smaller, smaller than the watermelons we saw today in HEB. But in the 10th century, uh, um, yes, the Chinese, the Kitans start to have more water, watermelons. And this is a Kitan servant and holding a spittoon uh, standing behind his Chinese master. Uh, these two Chinese servants presenting wines. And it's very likely this piece is made for, for offering um, um, uh, to the tomb owners. Uh, this, is, this is definitely not for, for the use of, uh, by the people during their daily life. This is for included in tombs. So for, this, uh, for the uh, tricolor glazes pieces, they mostly for the daily use, like this one, Kalavinka. And other smaller categories for uh, for burial, like this watermelon. Uh, we're, I'm just amazed to find it when I, when I so a couple of months ago when I went through our storage, I was just so shocked to see this watermelon in our uh, in our Leo Dynasty collection. Um, I would love to put this out. I'm pretty sure the kids will love it. Um, finally, I just want to show you. This Liao Dynasty pagoda um, I visited a couple of years ago. It's in Inner Mongolia. Um, when I was there, it, it was, I think it was in January. It was cold, very, very cold. And nobody's there. And you can, the only sounds you can hear, and I, or I could hear there, is just the wind, the sound from the, from the bells, and also a few uh, sounds made about by the magpies from the distance. And you can feel, even this pagoda is over a thousand years old. You can feel um, um, uh, the culture or the lifestyle that the Kitans used to live here. Um, I'll just play it a little bit, you can hear the sounds. Yeah, that's pretty much. That's a very quick tour. Tour. Let me just play to the next one. Yeah, that's just my brief story of our amazing uh, Liao Dynasty ceramics. Um, if you have any questions, feel free. Uh, let me yeah. see. Yeah. Um. So I know it's it's a little bit past seven, but if you can stay with us, please do. And thank you so much yeah. for um, sharing this incredible PowerPoint with us. Um, and, you know, we have to thank, um, thank you to the family and the donors, because we have such a rich Asian collection due to the generosity of, you know, Lenore and Walter Brown and also Kay and Tom Edson. So it's just, it's incredible to kind of have all of these um, pieces together and we're looking at them together. Um, one thing I see from the chat already is that the pagoda, do you know the purpose of it or was that a religious pagoda? Oh, uh, okay. Yes, that's, that's a very good question. Um, pagoda actually uh, um, started from India. Um, uh, it's originally called a stupa for holding reliquaries when the high-ranking monks or even the Buddha passed away, uh, their body were cremated. cremated. Sometimes there are a few remains uh, that uh, from those cremations uh, were preserved in the stupas. So when Buddhism reached China, and the Chinese architects start to creating this kind of a vertical shaped pagoda 
again, it's also for holding reliquaries and other like sutras and also other Buddhist uh, objects in the basement. Um, let me just uh, put this one out. Uh, in the basement. So this pagoda is called, the name of this pagoda is called 10,000 Volumes of Lotus Sutra. It's a very long name, but that's the name for this pagoda. Um, you can see the lotus flower petals around the space, and, and all these images are either guardians or deities or bodhisattvas. Unfortunately, some of them have been effaced during the Cultural Revolution. But upper level, they're still in pretty good condition. And yes, when I was there, uh, probably I was the only one on site. And it was really, really cold. You can imagine like Kitans lived there a thousand years ago. Um, their life, how their lifestyle is. <laughs> so that's why um, I firmly believe the climate a very strong influence on people's taste of the art and how they uh, make art and they also how they appreciate art as well. People from more tough conditions, uh, weather climates, very likely produce art that is rustic and coarse, and people from the South a lot more refined. And then uh, we had just a, a spelling question. The Catan peoples, how do you um, spell that? Uh, it's, it's spelled K H I T N. Okay. Yeah, Kitan. Uh, actually, in Russian, in Russian, the Chinese is called Kitans still today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, believe it or not. So, um, the, the Kitans control a very large landmass. That is actually, they controlled a, a shortcut trading routes to Europe. During that time, Europe was Byzantine. So, uh, in a lot of Liao tombs, we found uh, amber. Glass, well, uh, glass bottles, and also uh, coins from the Byzantine world. So if you want to travel to Europe, going through Siberia, that route is a lot shorter than going through the Silk Road, which is south, passing the desert. So the Kitans embrace all cultures, not only from the Chinese, but also from Europe, from Central Asia. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I hope you guys have a good time. Yeah, hope, like yeah, next time when you're in the gallery, try to stop, spend a little more time in our Liao <laughs> Dynasty gallery. I will definitely uh, uh, um, present some new pieces there. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a great evening. Thank you.